Hello, and welcome to the second installment of the House Guest Hemingway webinar series. I'm Suzanne Delgizzo, the editor of the Hemingway Review and the chair of the Hemingway Society Media Committee. I'm pleased to welcome you today to our second installment, which features the ambitious Hemingway Letters project team. Uh, this project is taking place over 17 volumes in many, many years. And we are so pleased to have the team here to give us an update after uh, the recent publication of volume five. My main role right now is just to orient you in this Zoom webinar. So as an attendee, you are in view and listen only mode. What that means is that you can see and hear us, but we can't see or hear you. Your mic will remain muted and your camera will remain off during the entire webinar. If you'd like to communicate with us, the main way you can do that is by scrolling your mouse cursor across the bottom of the screen. When you do that, you should see a Q&A function enabled. It has an icon that says Q&A with two dialog bubbles. If you click on that icon, you will have a window pop up and you can ask us questions. Feel free to ask us questions at any point during the presentations. We'll put time aside at the end to run through questions and we'll prioritize questions that are asked multiple times. Today, we're also, if you joined us yesterday, we are upping the ante. We're adding some polls, which means occasionally our panelists will ask you your thoughts or opinions about something. So when you see a poll pop up on your screen, please participate. And we also have a series of PowerPoint presentations today. If while you're watching your PowerPoint, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a little smaller than you would like, drag your cursor in between the PowerPoint and the speaker, and you should be able to make the PowerPoint bigger, or if you prefer, the speaker bigger. Um, with that in mind, I also want to remind you that all these webinars are being recorded. And I also wanted to give a nod to a few folks yesterday who registered that they had sound issues. We've checked everything out on our end, and we are pretty good with our stream quality and our sound quality. So check your volume, uh, check your Wi-Fi, move your computer maybe closer to your Wi-Fi source, and hopefully that will help. With all that in mind, that we get down to today's business, I'd like to turn you over to Verna Kale, who is an associate, uh, associate editor of the Hemingway Letters Project and an assistant professor at Penn State University. Verna? Good afternoon. Um, or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to the House Guest Hemingway webinar and this special session by the team at The Letters Project. I'm Verna Kale, Associate Editor of The Letters, and I'm going to be facilitating our conversation today. This session will provide an update on the Hemingway Letters Project, the ongoing project to locate, edit, and produce the authorized scholarly edition of Hemingway's complete collected letters. This is being published in a projected 17 volumes by Cambridge University Press, and our presenters in this webinar will share highlights of volume five, which covers 1932 through May of 1934, and which was just published last month, and we hope that maybe you've got your copy in hand right now. At the end of the session, uh, Professor Spanier has an exciting announcement to make about a new offering in the series, so be sure to stick around after the Q&A for that. And though we can't see or hear you, I hope you will let us hear from you through the Q&A feature. As Suzanne explained, if you look down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see the little icon that looks like two word balloons. And if you click on it, it'll open up the sidebar where you can type your question. I will see them, but this isn't a two-way chat with other people in the webinar. I'm gonna try to answer some questions one-on-one -on -one in real time, uh, just typing here at my computer while the panelists speak. Others I'll take note of and save for the end when we have time for Q&A. So if I don't respond right away, uh, don't worry, I do see your questions and we'll do our best to respond as time allows. Each panelist is gonna present for about 10 minutes, so there should be time for your questions at the end. And just a few more tech notes in case this is your first Zoom webinar. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, attendees can choose to enlarge the PowerPoints. Um, 
be careful because it's easy to accidentally minimize your zoom screen and you end up with a postage stamp size video in the corner of your monitor. If that happens, don't panic. Just hold your cursor in the bottom right of the tiny screen and you'll see a green arrow, click it to restore the session. And we also have a couple polls and trivia that we're gonna toss out there for you to vote in. So when those pop up, please enter your answers. Um, so even though we can't all be together in Wyoming and Montana as we had planned, we're looking forward to a fun and interactive webinar with you today. And so to kick things off, uh, let's start with a poll. We are curious to know, if our poll pops up there, if you could join Hemingway for one of his adventures covered in volume five of the letters, which would you choose? Fishing the Gulf Stream with Carlos Gutierrez, having your portrait painted by Waldo Pierce, exploring Havana with Jane Mason, riding horses and fly fishing in Montana with the Murphy family, having a laugh in New York City with Dorothy Parker and Robert Benchley, attending a bullfight in Spain with Sidney Franklin or the handsome matador of your choice, or hunting kudu on safari in East Africa with Philip Percival. We'll give you a few more seconds to decide and then uh, we'll reveal the results. Making in just to tell you, we have 64% voted. Do you want to keep it okay. open a bit longer? Um, we'll give you a couple more seconds. I know it's a hard decision. There's some really fun options there. <laughs> I get seasick, so I'm not going to pick the first option. Can you hear the dog barking outside? Yes. <laughs> All right. Exploring Havana with Jane Mason. You got the top votes. Okay, so uh, it seems like you you guys are going to love Miriam's talk especially. Um, so for, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first panelist, Sandra Spanier. Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of English at Pennsylvania State University. She is general editor of the Cambridge edition of the Letters of Ernest Hemingway and a co-editor of each volume published to date, as well as the author or editor of other books and articles on not only Ernest Hemingway, but also Martha Gellhorn and Kay Boyle. I'll hand things over to Sandy. Unmute. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm. Okay. Are you seeing my uh, PowerPoint? Yes. All right. Um, well, thanks very much, Verna. We're delighted to be here today, and since the webinar opened with Cuban music, I'll maintain the mood by sharing this photo of Miriam, Katie, and me last summer in Havana for the biennial Colloquio Hemingway with Hemingway's favorite hotel, the Ambos Mundos, behind us on Obispo Street. Volume 5 spans January 1932 through May 1934. With the critical and commercial success of the best-selling 1929 novel, A Farewell to Arms, Hemingway had achieved international renown and entered his prime. During this period, he completed and published his monumental bullfighting book, Death in the Afternoon, and a short story collection, Winner Take Nothing. When not actively writing, he was most often fishing, hunting, or traveling in the company of family and friends. He traversed the United States between Key West, Piggott, Arkansas, and Wyoming and Montana. Here we see him at the El Bar T Ranch with his wife Pauline waiting, reading in the background in a rocking chair here outside their cabin. He pursued his new passion for big game fishing in the Gulf Stream off the coast of Cuba. In late 1933, he embarked on a long anticipated safari in British East Africa. He also began writing for the new men's magazine, Esquire. From the very first issue published in autumn 1933, he was Esquire's leading contributor. 
His articles took the form of letters chronicling his adventures, his work now reaching a wide popular readership on a regular basis, and he had to be their lead correspondent, so you'll see his name is at the very top of the list. Upon returning from Africa in April 1934, he purchased his beloved boat, Pilar. Through it all, he was a prolific correspondent. Volume 5 includes 393 letters directed to 100 recipients. The March 1934 issue of Vanity Fair featured a full-page Ernest Hemingway paper doll captioned, Ernest Hemingway, America's own literary caveman, hard drinking, hard fighting, hard loving, all for art's sake. It was number five of seven in a series of Vanity Fair's own paper dolls by illustrator Konstantin Alahalov that also included J.P. Morgan, the Prince of Wales, and Albert Einstein. The mustached central figure of Hemingway clad in a leopard skin loincloth holding a club in one hand and a dead rabbit in the other is captioned Ernie the Neanderthal Man. He is flanked by four costumes that capture various personae. Here we have Ernie as the unknown soldier, wearing a World War I uniform with a Red Cross armband and blood-stained leg bandage leaning on a crutch. Here is Ernie as the lost generation, writing at a cafe table crowded with bottles. Ernie as Isaac Walton, seated atop a pile of swordfish on a boat named Anita. And Ernie as Don Jose, the Toreador, standing tall in a matador's costume, holding a vanquished bull by the horn. Hemingway's appearance in the March 1934 Vanity Fair marks his place at the hub of the happenings of his time. The lead articles were titled Roosevelt's Revolution by Charm, an assessment of the first year of Franklin D. Roosevelt's presidency and James Joyce, Genius Becomes Legal, reporting the recent lifting of the U.S. ban on Joyce's 1922 novel, Ulysses. A color caricature of Joyce, captioned portrait of the artist as a bestseller, filled the facing page. In Vanity Fair's series of modern painters, the issue featured a full page color reproduction of Pablo Picasso's The Absinthe Drinker, which happened to be owned by composer George Gershwin. The issue also carried full page portraits by renowned photographer Edward Steichen of such notables as President Roosevelt, Sinclair Lewis and Dorothy Thompson. The text reads one, America's most famous novelist and the other, our ablest woman foreign correspondent. Actress Mary Pickford, America's Sweetheart, and German-born singer and film star Marlena Dietrich, the Teuton Siren. Hemingway knew Joyce, Picasso, and Sinclair Lewis. At about the time the March 1934 Vanity Fair hit the newsstands, he would meet Dietrich aboard the SS Paris as he returned from Africa by way of Europe. It was the beginning of a platonic but passionate lifelong friendship and correspondence. Although Dietrich eluded the, the press when the ship docked in New York City on April 3, 1934, Hemingway's return was hailed in the New York papers. The news photos showed him grinning broadly, leaning against the ship's rail, Pauline at his side. Years after their marriage ended, Hemingway's first wife, Hadley, said of him, he was so complicated, so many sides, you could hardly make a sketch of him in a geometry book. Taken together, his collected letters reveal the many facets that have too often been obscured by the mythical macho figure that sometimes threatens to overwhelm our view of Hemingway, the human being, and the writer. I'll touch here on just a few of those facets as depicted in Vanity Fair and manifested in the letters of volume five, starting with Ernie as the unknown soldier. One of the dramas that plays out in the letters is Hemingway's feud with Paramount Pictures over the 1932 movie adaptation of his World War I novel, A Farewell to Arms, starring Helen Hayes and Gary Cooper, 
for which director Frank Borsage had filmed an alternate happy ending. While visiting his in-laws in Arkansas, Hemingway received a cable from the studio's publicist that two prints were, quote, unexpectedly available for a private showing of the film for his family and friends in Piggott on or before the night of the Broadway premiere. Hemingway cabled back, use your imagination as to where Paramount can put two prints unexpectedly available of Borsage version of Farewell to Arms, but do not send them here. Although Paramount bought picture rights and the chance to make a great picture, they did not buy the right to make me look at a silly one. Death in the Afternoon was the culmination of Hemingway's long-held ambition to write a definitive nonfiction book on bullfighting, lavishly illustrated. He tangled with his editor, Maxwell Perkins, over how many photos could be included in the book while keeping it affordable during the Great Depression. Their target price was $3.50. Perkins suggested a dozen photos. They settled on 81. When the leftist critic Mac, Max Eastman published a review titled Bull in the Afternoon, charging Hemingway with wearing false hair on the chest, he was enraged, as his markings on a copy of the article suggest, and this survives among his many thousands of papers at the Kennedy Library in Boston. In letters to an array of recipients, Hemingway vowed to break Eastman's jaw if he ever encountered him in person. In 1937, the two would meet by chance in Max Perkins' office, with Hemingway hitting Eastman in the face with a book and Perkins breaking up the fight. Here we have Ernie as the lost generation. Hemingway maintained many of the literary friendships forged in Paris in the 20s. He fished with John Dos Passos and Archibald MacLeish in Key West, lamented the troubles of F. Scott Fitzgerald in letters to mutual friends, and stayed in touch with Ezra Pound. When Ford Maddox Ford invited him to write a testimonial to Pound, Hemingway wrote, any poet born in this century or in the last 10 years of the preceding century who can honestly say that he has not been influenced by or learned greatly from the work of Ezra Pound deserves to be pitied rather than reproved. And we chose this letter as the frontispiece for the volume because we like Hemingway's colorful commentary on his uh, malfunctioning typewriter up here. Um, he didn't like to write blurbs to begin with, but when his typewriter didn't behave, he was irritated. On the other hand, his relationship with his early mentor, Gertrude Stein, godmother to his first son, Bumby, was irreparably broken. In her 1933 autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, Stein described Hemingway as physically frail and accident prone, and she claimed credit for teaching him to write. Hemingway was incensed and railed against the book in letters to Pound, Perkins, and others, but he was also hurt by her betrayal. To Arnold Gingrich, the founder of Esquire, he wrote, well, I liked Stein very much and was always damn nice to her and loyal as hell until kicked out on my backside. I'm learning to be careful about liking people, being damn nice to same, and especially being loyal. What the hell, though? It's not worth it, but it gives you such a jolt to have someone lie so much and with such malice. The letters capture Hemingway's exuberant enthusiasm as he discovers the thrill of big game fishing off the coast of Cuba. Last month, The New Yorker carried a previously unpublished Hemingway story under the title Pursuit as Happiness, as well as an interview about it with grandson Sean Hemingway. In the story, Hemingway relates his marlin fishing adventures in the chartered boat Anita with Captain Joe Russell and Cuban fisherman Carlos Gutierrez, including an hours long fight with a spectacularly big one that got away after they had to splice two lines together and Carlos accidentally cut the live line. When I read this story, it seemed strangely familiar. Going back to the letters, I realized that Hemingway had described that exact event in a letter of July 7th, 1933, on Hotel Ambos Mundo stationery, <laughs> to his friend Henry Strader. After cutting away the live line, Carlos wanted to kill himself, he wrote. He wanted to kill himself. That was yesterday. 
Two hours, 25 minutes, 10 minutes from where we hooked him, 16 jumps, fish as big around as a horse, about 14 feet. The letters allow us to compare Hemingway's breathless, blow-by-blow, real-time account of events to the carefully crafted narratives that would come later. That letter, and now the newly published story, allow us to appreciate even more Hemingway's triumph that very afternoon, the day after he lost the big fish and the the afternoon uh, of July 7th after he wrote to Strader describing it, when he caught a record 12 foot, eight inch, 468 pound marlin brought to gaff in 65 minutes. Hemingway's three month fishing expedition, mid April to mid July, 1933, during which he and his party caught, caught 52 marlin was the subject of his very first piece for Esquire, Marlin Off the Morrow, a Cuban letter, and it included a photo of his record catch. Which brings us back to the central figure, Ernie the Neanderthal Man. On September 28, 1932, he wrote to Max Perkins from a, from a remote hunting camp at Timber Creek, Wyoming. Day before yesterday killed the biggest bull elk I've ever seen, a full seven pointer. Must have weighed over a thousand pounds on the hoof. This letter is probably my favorite in the volume as a physical object. It is written on both sides of a ripped off piece of a brown paper bag, and you can see the serrated edges on the left. In the paragraph immediately following his description of the bull elk, Hemingway wrote, they brought the mail last week, rode 45 miles to camp with it, comes again tomorrow. I went out without pencils or paper like a damn fool and have only a stub of pencil and this paper sack. Hemingway's letters evoke the immediate circumstances of their composition and narrate the events of his life in real time. And it seems fitting to end with this one as it also evokes the place where we will meet next summer, live and in person, for our postponed biennial international conference in Wyoming and Montana. Thanks. I am going to try to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Sandy. Um, our next presenter is Miriam B. Mandel, who is presenting on Jane Mason, Beauty, Art, and Trouble. She is joining us from Israel, and so if you note a slight lag between her video and the audio, this may just be due to the distance. Um, it's not uh, it's not a problem with the webinar. We're not going offline or anything, so don't worry about that. Uh, Mandel Emerita from Tel Aviv University is co-editor with Sandra Spanier of the Letters of Ernest Hemingway, Volumes 4 and 5. She has published numerous books and articles on Hemingway, particularly on Hemingway in Spain and Africa. She is currently working on the Letters, Volume 6 as a co-editor with Sandra Spanier and myself. Her talk will tell us about a rather enigmatic and misunderstood person in Hemingway's life, Jane Mason. And while Miriam is getting her slides ready, uh, let's start off with a poll. All right, um, this is sort of a trivia question to see uh, how much you know about Jane Mason. Who among the following had Jane Mason not yet met by 1934? Archibald McLeish, the poet, Gabriel Castaño, the artist, Arnold Gingrich, publisher of Esquire, Carlos Gutierrez, fisherman, or Richard Cooper, British officer, coffee planter, and hunter. So we'll give you a few seconds to think that over. We're no worried about 45% voted. Okay. Let me know when you want to stop. This is kind of a, this one's a hard one because you kind of have to think, well, where was Hemingway and uh, when did he meet Jane and who were they hanging out with? And we'll let you think it over a little bit more. All right, it looks like Miriam's about ready to go. So put in your final answer. Arnold Gingrich, publisher of Esquire. All right, uh, good job. So if you ever watch uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, then you know that if uh, 
if they ask the audience, the audience usually together will come up with the right answer, and you guys did. So um, you probably know that Jane Mason would eventually marry Arnold Gingrich, but she had not yet met him by 1934. And now I will hand things over to Miriam. Miriam, unmute, please. You're unmuted, but not sharing your power, power, oh, you remuted. Okay, you're unmuted, but you need to share your PowerPoint, Mary. Okay, I'm trying to share my PowerPoint and I don't see, okay, here goes. How's that, is that okay? Still Thank not you sharing. Very much. No, still not sharing. Would you like me to share it for you? Yes, please. Okay, give me one minute. And also and give while me we, while we give the cues for the for the screen changes, please. While Suzanne is uh, getting that back up, um, I can answer one of the questions that's come in on the chat. Um, okay, I'm going to I'm going to try to um, bring my screen up again. Oh, there we go. Okay, you're ready to go, Miriam. I'm ready to go now? Yep. Okay, thank you, Verna. And welcome everyone to today's Get Together with Jane Mason. If you're interested in Jane, you will love volume five. And you should prepare to buy volume six too, which will be ready about two years from now. But volume five is, I think, the best place for getting to know Jane. Next slide, please. Okay. You can see that Jane figures very prominently in volume five. Only Maxwell Perkins and Arnold Gingrich, Hemingway's editors for this period, outrank her in frequency of correspondence. Here's a quick biographical overview of Jane's life. Jane grew up in wealth, married early and added over her lifetime the surnames of five men to that of her father. First, the surname of her mother's second husband, multimillionaire Lyman Kendall, and then those of her own four husbands, Mason, a high-ranking executive of Pan American Airlines, Hamilton, a leading figure in the Republican Party, Abel, a journalist, and Gingrich, the founding editor of Esquire. Clearly, Jane moved in worldly, sophisticated circles, and yet she was able to make her mark, partly, no doubt, because she was so beautiful. So beautiful that she modeled the beauty products in a national magazine, a detail which tied her ineluctably to Margot McCumber. We must remember, however, that Margot McCumber and Helene Bradley live in fiction, but Jane Kendall Mason lived inside her own self. She had her own life. As a girl, Jane studied at a private art school in New York, but her education was brief. And at 17, she was launched into social life. In 1927, aged only 18, she married a Yale man,
and began her life in Havana, where she and her husband designed and built this handsome home in Jaimanitas, just outside of Havana. Their mansion later became the Canadian ambassadorial residence, and an inventory of its contents includes several sculptures by Japanese-American Isamu Noguchi, himself a student of Constantine Brancusi. Among them is this elegant bust of Jane. In the 1930s, Jane established the Juanita shop in Havana as an outlet for Cuban arts and crafts. For this tourist shop, she found, promoted, and commissioned local handwork. She also had an eye for modern art and is credited with discovering a young Cuban artist, Gabriel Gastaño Morales. Jane's sponsorship of Cuban art is perhaps the least discussed of her activities, so today we will focus on this. Gabriel Gastaño, born in 1900, was poor and untrained when Jane first saw his work and recognized his talent. In 1932, Jane underwrote a year's residence for him in Trinidad, one of Cuba's loveliest cities, and he returned from there with 48 canvases. Here you can see two of them under the chandeliers and a third one on the right by the lamp. Another three hang in the stairwell of the house. 48 canvases are enough for an exhibit, and Jane convinced a New York gallery to show this unknown artist. She gathered big name sponsors, she organized publicity, and she enlisted Hemingway to write a piece for the show's catalog. On 30 December, 1932, a cable from Piggott informed Jane, herself sick with the flu, that Ernest is trying to write the foreword. But this was a turbulent period of Hemingway's life. He was fighting publicly with Paramount Pictures and privately with his sister, Carol. And on 12 January, 1933, he cabled his excuse. Dreadfully sorry, didn't do forward, wanted to and couldn't. The Arden Gallery ran the Castaño exhibit for three weeks. 18 months later, as we will see in volume six, Hemingway would also organize an exhibit in a New York gallery and write a foreword for its catalog. Perhaps he was inspired by Jane's own initiative. We have, most fortunately, been able to find images of some of Castaño's work, so that now you can see what Jane saw. Here is Jane Mason at home. This, still hanging in Jaimanitas, looks like Jane as well. Here's a detail of it. This also hangs in the Jaimanitas living room. It has an intimate feel to it, and the many blues and browns are striking. Here's the church and plaza in Trinidad. And an informal musical evening in Trinidad. In 1935, Castaño is trying out a different style. And in 1938, he is different again. In May 1932, early in volume two, in volume five, and again in the spring of 1933, Jane was hospitalized at Doctors Hospital in New York. But for most of volume five, she was in Havana, living her life, supervising the staff of her estate, running the Juanita shop, traveling, fishing, drinking, and organizing memorable parties for important people. She adopted a son, Anthony, for whom Hemingway was godfather, and she discovered and promoted the artist whose work we have just seen. In volume six, we will see her try her hand at creative writing. 
And according to Jane's granddaughter, Jane played the piano and harp and organized concerts and wrote sweet melodies. Jane's was an active artistic life, but the combination of money, privilege, beauty, artistic temperament, and according to Arnold Gingrich, the disruptions accompanying hypoglycemia or hyperinsulinism spelled trouble. Her life was punctuated by abandoned projects, marked by a lack of stability and of the intense focus that artistic production requires. Jane was self-aware enough to write, as a summary of her life, this epitaph, talents too many, not enough of any. She was felled in the 1960s by a severe stroke which affected her speech and paralyzed her legs. She died in 1981. In volume five, however, she was in her 20s, lovely and lively and passionate about the arts. Perhaps we could try to remember her like that. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, we have a quick question that maybe you can answer coming in in the Q&A, um, wondering, is Jane's house open to the public? If you go down to Cuba, to Jaimenitas, can you, can you tour it today? Uh, well, I don't know the answer. Um, Sandy knows better. She was uh, in Jaimenitas and she saw the, the house and she provided some of the photographs of the artwork that you saw. Um, today, Cuba is in a very difficult situation, so I don't know if the house is open. Do you know, Sandy? I, the house is not open. The house is the residence of the ambassador, the Canadian ambassador to Cuba, and has been since 1949. Um, in 2002, I was contacted, it was about the same time that there was a project uh, announced to restore Finca Vigia with the Finca Vigia Foundation. And I was contacted because of publicity about that by Denise Jacques, whose husband was the Canadian ambassador to Cuba, and she herself was a historian and was very interested in Jane Mason and Hemingway connection. And so she uh, invited me there on a few occasions, and it was an incredible privilege to be able to see where Jane lived. Um, but that was a very special experience, and I, it's not open to the public. All right, um, we'll move on to our last presenter today, who will talk some about uh, the research methods that go into producing annotations for the edition. We have Katie Warzak, a PhD candidate in the English and African American Studies departments at Penn State and graduate research assistant for the Letters Project. She's also the editorial assistant for Legacy, a journal of American women writers, a former junior research fellow at the Newberry Library in Chicago, and she has contributed annotations research to the portable Anna Julia Cooper, edited by Sh Shirley Moody Turner and forthcoming from Penguin. And to get us started on some of the finer points of tracking Hemingway's movements, we have another trivia question for you guys. Um, if, you're, if you know your geography, you might be able to get this one right. How long did it take to travel between Key West and Havana on the P&O steamship? Three hours, six hours, 12 hours, or 18 hours. So think about how far away uh, Havana was from Key West, how fast that boat uh, was probably moving, and put in your guesses. These are the kinds of questions that we, we spend a lot of time thinking about because we have to you know, know how Hemingway and how his mail <laughs> got from point A to point B and what was possible back in the 30s by 1930s standards. We're holding pretty steady at just under 70%. So do you want to give it a few more okay. seconds? Uh, fine. It's, it's time to take a guess, put in your final answer. Once again, the audience knows their stuff. It took about six hours. So that is a lot faster than the Polar. <laughs> um, and 
uh, the Pilar, I think, took about twenty, about twelve hours. Is that is that about right? Twelve hours to get there. So the 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 boats that were carrying freight and mail and stuff could go a little bit faster than Hemingway could. Um, all right, now I'll hand things over to Katie. All right. Specific methodologies for finding the elusive author and the place to and people he mentions in his letters. This Paper will explore some of the methods the project has successfully used to trace the letter proof tricky because although Hemingway references a number of travel plans in this brief piece of correspondence, he uh, dates the letter Thursday uh, and makes no mention of the year. What the letter does mention is that Mary and presumably her husband Paul are near Hemingway and his family, that Pauline and Patrick, but not Gregory, are coming to see them, and that the weather is splendid. A lot of movement is happening, but what remains unclear is who is traveling where and when. There is such a lack of clarity, in fact, that the project initially dated this letter to circa May 24th, 1934. The letter's actual date is circa January 21st, 1932, but we were able to uncover this fact only as a result of extensive research. The first clue that the letter belonged in 1932 rather than 1934 was Hemingway's note that, quote, it was fine to hear you are so near, unquote, which meant that Mary and Paul were not at their home in Pigott, Arkansas when Hemingway was writing. According to Ruth A. Hawkins's Unbelievable Happiness and Final Sorrow, The Hemingway Pfeiffer Marriage, in 1932, Mary and Paul, quote, vacationed in Miami rather than their usual winter sojourn to Phoenix to coincide with their expected attendance at Henry and Annie Pfeiffer's 50th wedding anniversary in Palm Beach, unquote. A March 9, 1932 Palm Beach Post article confirms Pauline's parents were in attendance at the wedding celebration and letters they wrote to Pauline and Hemingway in early February 1932 are penned on Miami Colonial Hotel stationery, indicating that when Hemingway says his in-laws are near, they are indeed quite near in Miami. However, the source that definitively points to this letter being written in 1932 is not a published scholarly source, newspaper article, or even another letter, but instead a train schedule. Hemingway mentions in his letter that Pauline and Patrick, quote, will leave here 5, 10 p.m. to arrive 9.30, unquote. For this part of the research, we turn to the extensive collection of train schedules researchers had to request through interlibrary loan, uh, the days when, when we could do that, uh, for this and other volume five work. According to the official guide of the railways, in May 1934, an evening train departed Key West at 5.40 p.m. and arrived in Miami at 10.20 p.m., which is close to the times that Hemingway mentions in his letter, but the February 1932 train schedule there we go, uh, matches the one Hemingway sends Mary exactly, since a train departs Key West at 5.10 p.m. and arrives in Miami at 9.30 p.m. This schedule also clearly puts Hemingway's letter before March 1932 because the train schedule changes that month, with the train departing at 5 rather than at 5.10. Given these train schedules and a letter to Hemingway from Paul Pfeiffer dated February 10th, 1932, that says, quote, Mother and I sure enjoyed having Pauline and Patrick visit us, unquote. This piece of correspondence is clearly from either January or early February 1932 and known Hemingway travel schedules, as well as weather reports, allowed the project to be even more specific in its dating of this letter. Although the project could date the letter to January or February 1932, using the official guide of the railways, the question remained of when exactly in that time frame Hemingway penned the letter. Thankfully, Pauline's quest for a new nanny and Hemingway's comment about splendid weather helped us pin it down. 
As Hawkins tells us, Paul and Mary had missed Gregory's baptism on Thursday, January 14th, 1932. So they were not near in early to mid-January, and Pauline's visit to her parents happened before February 10th, as evidenced by her father's letter of the state mentioning how pleasant her visit was. Unfortunately, between January 14th and February 10th, there were three Thursdays, uh, January 21st, January 28th, and February 4th. However, as Brewster Chamberlain notes in the Hemingway log, Pauline left Key West on February 9th, 1932 to search for a nanny, meaning it is highly unlikely that she would have left to visit her parents in Miami on February 4th, then returned to Key West before taking the train from Key West to New York, since that would be a lot of traveling in the span of only five days. This deduction left the project with either January 21st or 28th as the date for this letter. And given that Hemingway mentions Blended weather. Um, we knew that we needed something that you know was uh, where the weather was fine, things were going well, and that was not the case on January 28th, uh, as the Key West Citizen reports that a quote slight disturbance that developed in the Gulf of Mexico Saturday night crossed northern Florida and this morning is central off the South Atlantic coast. It was also attended by copious to heavy rains. Unquote. So not fine weather at all. However, on January 21st, the Key West citizen reported that weather conditions were mostly fair, meaning Hemingway most likely penned the note on this day. Hemingway's letter to his mother-in-law might have, at first glance, not included many helpful details, but simply because he noted that his in-laws were near, that Pauline's train left at 5, 10 p.m., and he wrote that the weather was good, project researchers were able to date this letter circa January 21st, 1932. As you can see in volume five, where you have this paper basically summed up in two paragraphs. Now, normally the research process for a single annotation isn't as extensive or unwieldy as this one, as researchers for the project have a myriad of resources at their fingertips. However, searches have become a bit more difficult, um, but also strangely enough, a bit more pleasurable as a result of COVID-19 and the need to work remotely. One example that highlights both the frustrations and benefits of the remote work is an annotation I worked on for a June 2nd, 1935 letter to Hemingway's sister, Ursula Jepson. In this piece of correspondence, Hemingway mentions that he has encountered a number of Oak Park inhabitants in Florida, Specifically, quote, all the Mills kids and Harold Peterson and Bessie Yeager all married to different people, unquote. Given that these individuals are not mentioned in volume one of the letters of Ernest Hemingway and are relatively obscure, I had to rely on online resources, including newspaper databases and Ancestry.com to find them. This slowed the research process somewhat, but didn't stop it by any means, since after quite a bit of time spent researching the eight Mills children, uh, I can say, for instance, when they lived, what they did, uh, the boys worked at the family factory and the girls married and were socialites, and about when they went to Florida and saw Hemingway in 1935. Reading about these adventures and trips from one's apartment might be frustrating in the sense that research is slowed, but it is also surprisingly satisfying. Uh, being confined to my 480 square foot apartment while reading about deep sea fishing and beautiful Key West and Florida beaches as well as other destinations, has helped to satisfy a personal desire to get out, so to speak. During the pandemic, travels I might otherwise engage in, uh, such as visiting my parents in Wisconsin or my partner in California, aren't really advisable, but it hurts no one for me to travel to Florida or elsewhere through Hemingway's letters or newspaper accounts of others' trips. This also enhanced my personal appreciation of Hemingway's desire to travel and see the world, which makes Volume 5, as well as Volume 6, work surprisingly good pandemic reading. Tracking Hemingway across the United States, Europe, and Africa is quite a task given his general unwillingness to lay out his itinerary as some of his correspondents, such as Gustavus Uncle Gus Pfeiffer, so very kindly do, but the effort is worthwhile. Hemingway's correspondence not only satisfies a pandemic travel itch, but more importantly, leaves us quite a few breadcrumbs related to his travel. Then by using such sources such as the Key West Citizen, train schedules, weather reports, and more, we're able to fill in the rest of the trail. As a result of these efforts, we are able to not only more accurately date the author's letters, but add to the details of his life and provide a more complete picture of Hemingway the Traveler. With many more volumes of letters ahead of us and a lot more Hemingway travels coming up, including trips to Europe, Africa, and Asia, 
there will be plenty of time and opportunity to further hone the project's travel research methodologies. Hopefully, by the end of it all, we'll not only know a great deal more about Hemingway's travels, the places he visited, and the ways he moved, but also have made it substantially easier for other researchers to track this often elusive traveler. Thank you. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, so we do have some time for questions and I've been um, monitoring your questions as they come in. So feel free to uh, type, up, type up a question. I'll throw it out here to our panelists. Um, we have a question about Pauline Pfeiffer that asks our panelists, can you discuss the work of Pauline Pfeiffer? So we, I mean, I, I feel a little bad. She's sort of in the background in that one picture, but we didn't really mention Pauline today. So um, anybody want to chime in on, on what Pauline was doing, what kind of work, what she was doing to support Hemingway at uh, the time period of volume five? In, vol in volume five, she is doing a lot of um, house renovating. Uh, she's got uh, plumbers and roofers and painters and all kinds of other people all over the place. She's redesigning the Key West house. Uh, she's keeping the home fires burning and she is letting Hemingway do whatever he wants to do. Her letters to him are they are just the perfect letters for any man would want to receive, I guess. All she does is she loves him and she wants him to be happy and she wants him to catch a fish and she wants him not to worry about anything and she's looking forward to seeing him again. So I think her major occupation at this time was, was architectural and uh, interior design and uh, taking care of the children and uh, she did a lot of traveling herself. She went to see her parents. She, went to pick up Bumby every once in a while. Um, so she was very, very busy. Thanks. Um, we also have uh, a question about what might not be in the letter. So this is a great question. Is there any sense that emerges that Hemingway was ever being, for whatever reason, occasionally deliberately elusive in his letter writing? I'm not thinking of anything in particular. Um, he was certainly writing these letters with an audience of one in mind, never imagining uh, that these would be published someday. Uh, so it, his letters are very of the moment. Um, he would talk about people. For example, when, when Tender as a Night was published, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel that took him nine years to write after The Great Gatsby, he did talk about Fitzgerald and all of his problems and Zelda Fitzgerald's mental illness and hospitalizations and Scott's drinking problems and the fact that he couldn't write anything. He didn't write, he only wrote one letter to Fitzgerald in the entire volume, but he wrote many, many letters about Fitzgerald. So maybe that was the case where he was sort of biting his tongue. Um, I think generally we don't see him uh, behaving in a very inhibited fashion in his letters. <laughs> there was uh, actually, there was sorry, one sorry, go ahead. there was one situation where we, he was being a little bit cagey. He wanted to postpone. He he just discovered all the wonderful fish in uh, the Gulf Stream, and he wanted to postpone the African safari, and uh, he didn't know or didn't want to do it to tell Mike Strader that the whole thing was going to be postponed. So he got a little bit into a mess. He kept writing other people. He says, well, I have to, I have to write the mic. I don't know what to say. And he was a little bit elusive there, but mostly he is very straightforward. He's very honest, very open. And, uh, and that's one of the pleasures of reading the letters. They're just transparent. He's not, he's not, he's not, uh, he's not, uh, hiding himself. I always um, find the letters really funny. I think that's something that a lot of people don't really realize is just how funny Hemingway was. And when you sit down and, and read them in order, um, 
you know, like in all together in the volume, you see his commentary on things and it, it does seem kind of unguarded and funny, I love it. Uh, this question is specifically directed at um, Sandy. Uh, can you discuss or give any more details on the letter written on the brown paper bag? And did Hemingway utilize any other odd sources of paper in his letter writing? Yes, he did. Um, well, the, the brown paper bag letter, what's, it's also striking to think how remote it was. And I, I know when we were talking about our, con our conference that was supposed to be right now in Wyoming and Montana, someone had said that of all the places Hemingway lived, Africa, Cuba, wherever, maybe the least change since his own time is that section of Wyoming and Montana. It is very, very still remote. Um, so when he was out on this hunting expedition, the El Barti Ranch, where that, that was civilization, that was, was where they were based, that was a 45 minute horse or 45 mile ride on horseback to the hunting camp. But also the ranch itself was so remote the nearest town was Cook City, Montana, and the mail only came once a week from Cook City. So this is a letter to his New York publisher, of all people, written on this brown paper bag. Um, and it was, it was mainly full of hunting details. Uh, there's a letter, the, when he got the um, telegram from Paramount, offering him in a, what he considered a very pushy way um, to try to get him to participate in publicity by attending a world premiere of the 1932 Hollywood, A Farewell to Arms in Piggott, Arkansas, and he wanted no part of it. He, he clearly drafted, he, he, he grabbed the first piece of paper handy and drafted his cable response on it. And it happened to be a bill from a veterinarian for boarding his sister-in-law Ginny's hunting dog, whose name was Hooli, H-O-O-L-I-E. So we find the strangest uh, types of paper sometimes. He has a whole collection of hotel stationery. He, he clearly couldn't go to a hotel without you know, grabbing a few uh, sheets of their stationery for when he might need it later. So he sometimes, it sometimes has gotten a little confusing when uh, he's writing on the Hotel uh, Ambos Mundo stationery, but we realize he's in Madrid, which means that he grabbed some before he sailed over to, to Spain. So there are all kinds of interesting uh, tidbits. Um, I think we, we have just enough time for maybe one more question, and then um, we'll move on to the, the last part of the presentation. Um, we've had some really wonderful comments in the Q&A, um, just expressing uh, appreciation for the amount of research that goes into to the project and um, I think that's I, it is a lot of research so I wanted to, to throw out a question to Katie who has been our graduate research assistant um, for a couple years now and you know just say this isn't um, a typical part of the the graduate um, curriculum and so can can you speak a little bit to what's you know, what's the appeal? What is it that turns a graduate uh, assistant into what one of the commenters in the chat called an investigative journalist? Uh, well, it, it, that comment's a little bit ironic since I, before deciding I wanted to do a PhD, I was going to go into journalism. Um, but I think one of the great appeals of this is the ability to, um, to dig um, and to see everything that uh, goes into not only a letter, but also um, a life, uh, Hemingway's life, which then oftentimes gets reflected in his literature. Um, and from a PhD scholar perspective, that's been invaluable for me because when I'm reading literature now, I'm, and I'm actually working on my dissertation, and this is applying in one of the books I'm looking at, um, it's not just the literature appears from, you know, the vacuum. Um, it's, not only goes through uh, a process of writing and putting oftentimes writers own experiences and thoughts into that literature, but also just the publication process. Uh, I mean, how different would death in the afternoon look if Maxwell Perkins had gotten his way and we only would have had a few photographs in there. So 
And this has been really productive um, in terms of not only getting to hone my own research skills and figure out, okay, how, what is everything that goes into this literature, um, but also seeing you know, just how just how far you can go in terms of finding, you know, the date of a letter based on a train schedule and a weather report. Thank you. Um, I think we probably, I mean, we could talk about Hemingway all day and there are a few more really great questions, but um, I think we probably should stick to our screen time limit and um, move on to uh, a, a brief presentation that Sandy and our good friends over at Cambridge University Press have prepared with um, an exciting announcement. I'll, I'll, let me talk for a second, uh, Suzanne, before you start this. Um, as many of you know, up until now, the Letters of Ernest Hemingway has been available only in print volume format. Um, I've been asked many, many times over the years if an electronic edition might become available. And I am delighted to be able to announce that, uh, thanks to the gracious permission of Patrick Hemingway, Cambridge University Press will soon be publishing the edition in electronic form as well. All five volumes to date will be released as electronic editions in late August, and all subsequent volumes will be published both in print and in electronic form. Each volume will be available for institutional purchase by libraries and other organizations through the Cambridge Core but also available for purchase by individuals as retail ebooks on a number of platforms, including Amazon's Kindle, Print Replica, uh, ebooks.com, Google, Gardner's Overdrive. Um, Cambridge University Press has, uh, for, for this special occasion of our webinar, uh, provided a brief demonstration video to give a sneak preview of how the volumes will be accessible via the Cambridge core that people would use in libraries. Um, so let's start the film, it's three minutes long, three and a half. Here we can see how we can navigate the page. Um, we get to the collection for the series, and in the list of collections featured in the Cambridge Core, we come to the Letters of Ernest Hemingway. Clicking on that takes us to the home page of the Hemingway Letters collection. Uh, in the banner on the right, it says search Hemingway Letters. We can do that. Uh, download list of titles comes under the signature there. Um, You can see the About tab, and clicking on that tab, you'll see some information about the edition. It includes some uh, videos. Cambridge can add content to that page at any time. Back on the home page of the collection, um, for demonstration purposes, we're going to select Volume 1. And here you'll see a book description, reviews of that particular volume, some selected reviews. This is under the information tab. Um, there's also next to that a content tab. And by clicking on this, and you can see, see in this book and search within full text is up in the right corner. Here we have every letter in the volume listed. Um, and you can see on the left, it says access for select content. It says select all. You could select every single letter. And we'll get to that in a minute. This is actually one of my favorite letters in the whole series so far. This is a broken hearted letter that Hemingway wrote to his friend Bill Horn after he has received a letter from uh, true love, Agnes von Borowski. She doesn't love me, Bill. She takes it all back. Um, the model for Catherine Barkley in A Farewell to Arms, Breaking Hemingway's Heart. 
Um, if you click on that, there, you can export the citation. So this is useful for students and scholars. You can choose Chicago format, your MLA, other, um, other recognized styles, and several actions. Save my bookmarks, download PDF, send to my Kindle, send to your Dropbox account, box account, sent to uh, Google Drive. And you could do the select all button. Finally, back on the home page, you can also simply type in the title of the volume into the main search bar. That will take you to volume five and over to the entire collection. So Cambridge will be creating another video uh, later on closer to publication that will show all of this in more detail and they will also share that new video on social media. They made this as a special demonstration for us. Um, and it demonstrates the Cambridge core features available to institutional purchasers. And again, I want to emphasize individuals can also purchase this on, if you're unaffiliated with a, a, a subscribing library or a library that's purchased the core version. So you can be sure when we have more news, we will spread the word far and wide and um, just stay tuned for this exciting new development. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Sandy, and thank you to the entire letters team for your time and your insights today, and to the audience for your wonderful questions, and Verna for your expert handling of Q&As and patience with me during polls. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. And now we'd like to remind you that we hope you will join us tomorrow, Sunday, July 19th at 4 p.m. It's our last uh, day in this House Guest Hemingway uh, series. And tomorrow we uh, feature Hemingway, a film by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. It's a discussion with producer Lynn Novick and associate producer Sarah Botstein. But the big news is that we have a 10 minute rough cut preview of the documentary, which is scheduled to air in spring 2021. And that session will be hosted by Alex Vernon. I'd also like to remind you about our membership meeting, which follows the documentary session. It's tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. To attend the membership meeting, you have to be a member of the Hemingway Society. So if you're, in, if you're not a member and you're interested, you can become a member at www.hemingwaysociety.org. And you, again, thanks to the presenters, wonderful, insightful presentation, and we hope to see you back here again tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.